Okay, great. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me, hopefully? Um, I'm Kim Arnold from Purdue University, and my colleague Matt Stilley is here at the table. He'll be up here in a, a little bit. Um, a couple other people I just want to point in the audience, Matt Bethune here next to Matt Bastilli is part of the team, and of course, the infamous John Campbell is part of the team as well. So um, we're very excited to be here, and we are going to talk a little bit here about course signals. Um, Okay, so quickly, we're not going to go too much into the model, um, but basically to give you an idea of the current model, we have um, a little graphic here for you. Basically, we look at three things. They're weighted differently depending on, um, weighted differently depending on predictability. So one of the things we look at is student characteristics, and this is things such as academic preparation, so we're looking at standardized scores, this type of thing. We're looking at GPA from high school. Um, also looking at some basic demographic information, like are they in-state, are they out-of-state, um, gender, this type of thing. We're also adding student effort, which in this model um, is important. It's a very behaviorally based model, so we take the assumption that if a student is doing poorly or would like to do better, if they put more effort into it, change their behavior, they can do better. So we look at things, right now the interaction with, the, with Blackboard, our learning management system, so we look at the number of times they log in, do they look at the practice sessions, do they do practice quizzes, this type of thing. And then of course, obviously, we do add student performance. Obviously, that's one of the best predictors of if you're going to pass a course or not. So what the grades are to date in course. Those all combine and we, you get a signal. You get the red, yellow, or green. Obviously, if you're getting a red, you might need to do something a little different. Um, probably need to seek some help. If you're getting the yellow, you, you're doing okay, but you probably could do a little bit better. And obviously, green is you know keep up the good work. This is displayed to the student, also the faculty member, and the faculty member um, then can send messages and interventions, depending on the instructor, that varies, dif varies drastically. Okay. So this basically, again, is just a visualization of, of what we see going into the funnel of student success. So these are the three big balls, the preparation, performance, and effort, again, feeding into the risk indicator. To show you just briefly some of the some of the results we've had, we can't speak too much about it, obviously, um, short time. But this is just a demonstration of one of the semesters we had. We're using our largest semester, um, and we had about 7,000 students that semester. 7,000 seats, excuse me. And so these are the results that we're seeing. This is across the board, and so you're seeing that the A's and B's there at the bottom getting significantly higher A's and B's than their cohorts, which are previous, so it's the same semester, previous year, same instructor is what we're looking at in this graph. So it's no big pedagogical changes, same instructor, same course just a year earlier. So that's what we're looking at when we are comparing grades here. Um, you see that there's more C's, less D's and F's, and there's slightly fewer W's, but. And then you see the, the graph on the right, the pictogram there, is, you know, we see 6.41% lower Ds, Fs, and Ws. And overall, we see that almost 11% more As and Bs were earned. I'm going to let Matt come up here, and I'll come back in a bit. So the grades are, the grades are one way of looking at whether or not we're being successful in terms of helping students learn. Um, the secondary piece to that involves retention and the long-term impact of having participated. Let me start out by saying this is by no means a direct causal relationship. So just to put that out there. Uh, but what we do see when we break out our signals groups, when we break our groups into actually two groups, we take a student cohort that started at Purdue in the fall of 2007 and break them into two groups. Uh, there are those who had signals at any point in time and students who had never had signals. Uh, and then we break out those signals groups 
by how many courses they actually had. And we aggregate it a little bit into having it at least once. So meaning once, two, three, four, five times, or just once. Only one instance or two or more instances. And then we track it out on retention modeling. This is the same model as the government's iPads model. So if you're familiar with retention reporting at the federal, United States federal government level, we use the same model here, first time, full time students. <coughs> Excuse me. What we end up with then, if you look all the way out to four years, that the students who never had signals at all um, are either retained and or graduate, we'll talk graduation in a second, at a just shy of 70% rate. Whereas if you look at a student who had signals at least one time or only one time, you're in the upper 80s. And if you have it more than once, mind you, that end is small, but even still, we're talking a 93 plus percent retention or graduation rate. The interesting thing too is if you look at the SAT scores, and actually I'm gonna to flip to the next screen, because this really kind of illustrates it quite nicely, is when you break out the graduation rates, uh, we've got a 41.2% graduation rate for students who never had signals versus 45 and a quarter for students who had it at least once, but a little bit lower for the two or more, which is an interesting point. If you do the math and you subtract just percentage point from percentage point, you'll actually see that a higher number of students are still enrolled at Purdue percentage-wise than uh, who had signals than those who were not. And so our, our, we maintain that after five years, which we'll get this coming September, we're gonna see a flip in that. And we're gonna see the two-year students, because most students at Purdue take four and a half to five and a half years to graduate. Um, we're gonna see that flip. And so that, that two or more percentage is going to jump and surpass the no signals group. But the interesting thing here is if you look at the SAT scores, the students who are least academically prepared as measured only by SAT score actually are retained at higher rates. It happened, you can see it on both screens. It's uh, both the far out on the right hand side here as well as the far right on the other screen. So we're really impacting students who are coming in slightly lesser prepared, potentially, um, who are taking some of our larger gateway courses, we know this for a fact, um, and who are struggling. And, and in those, those gateway courses, those high DFW rate courses, we know students are struggling anyhow. And so the extent that we can intervene at the instructor level and let the instructor say, you're not doing so hot, you need to be doing these things, or you need to stop and you need to come see me or go see your academic advisor, um, because that's where all of our registration takes place, is a pretty powerful piece. In terms of growth, uh, Kim touched on this a little bit, we've grown. Um, the, the data that you saw before that talked about the number of A's and B's and decreases in, in C's, D's and F's, things like that, um, it come from that fall of 09 semester when we had just under 9,000 seats involved. Um, we've been in transition the last few semesters moving from our own system to the Eleusian system and we've had challenges getting faculty to buy into the new system yet. However, our goal is next term, uh, next fall, to be in about 15,000 seats. Not unique students, but seats. So there's gonna be overlap. Um, our unique student count should actually be higher than that number. And then hopefully by this time next year, we're gonna be looking at nearly 20,000 seats being impacted across the university. To equate that a little bit differently, it's most of, it's probably 80 to 90% of the first year class, roughly 50% of the sophomore class, and probably 20 to 30% each of the junior and senior class. So we're talking large, hunks of the university, to use a technical term, being impacted by uh, course signals. Uh, just some high level parameter pieces too that just might be of interest. Over 115 instructors plus, this is as of last fall, so we have more this term, but 115 instructors, distinct instructors have utilized course signals. Um, in the last four terms, it's 78 alone. So this semester plus the last three, it's 78 distinct instructors. Across 80 plus courses, over 180 sections, over 17,000 unique students having been impacted by the system. So we're pretty wide reaching when you look at an aggregate. Um, our goal is to get a lot further, a lot more reaching across the university. Somebody asked yesterday, so everybody knows who John Campbell is here, so everybody knows what Course Signals is and uses it at Purdue, right? And no, not yet, we're getting there. But uh, the numbers tell the story and the numbers are what speak to faculty. And so as we show more and more positive outcomes, then we can bring more and more faculty on board. I think Kim's gonna wrap us up and then we'll have some time for questions. One of the things we do need to mention um, is that We've received a, a gr grant from the Gates Foundation and it's with their help that we're really able to scale this up on campus as well as work with some institutions across the country. So they've been certainly very helpful. 
Now, one of the important things, obviously, is to look at grades and retention. But when we're looking for um, adoption on campus, sometimes we definitely need to know what faculty perception is. And we want to know what student perception is because this is also an instrument to help empower them be stronger independent learners. So we've been very cognizant of this fact from the beginning. We've been doing surveys with students um, who experience signals at the end of every semester. And we've done a series of interviews with faculty. So I'm just gonna briefly touch on a few of these um, results, and then we'll open it to questions. So I'm not gonna read this slide to you. It, is, it will be available. We'll post links to it on Twitter. Um, and at the end, I'll show you another way to uh, receive it. But what we're seeing in general is that students, and we were looking at close to 12,000 students. Of course, it's anonymous, so I can't tell you how many were uh, unique students, but 12,000 return surveys over four semesters shows that in general, the students had a positive experience. You know, they also sought more help. They say, yeah, I did. I got more help than I probably would have, or I got more help um, in this course than I did a course without signals. And there's 61% of the students that even say, I'm pretty sure this helped, this affected my grade directly. Of course, student perception, so we won't say that's a scientific finding, but. Um, and motivation, obviously, is a big fact, especially in these gateway courses. When you're coming in as a first or second year student, you feel like maybe you're just a number, nobody really cares. Motivation is a very important, um, very important thing, and we see that, you know, 74% uh, of the students, that's a very large percent, and said, yeah, this did motivate me, I did do something because of the interventions I was getting from my instructor. We also see, one of the other things we've talked a lot about here is privacy, especially student privacy. And that has been a concern of ours from the very beginning. What are students going to really think? You know, we're looking at their Blackboard record, they know this. We're looking at some of their basic demographics. We're looking at their entrance criteria. What are students gonna think? Are they gonna think this is too big brother-esque, this type of thing? Well, what we see here, 86% of the students said, any of, any of that that I might have, it goes away because the benefit far outweighs it. So the ends justify the means, apparently, for the majority of these students. Uh, now, that doesn't say that some of them don't have privacy concerns. We have not been approached by a single student saying that they do. We've had a few faculty members, but in our history since 2007, we haven't had any students come to us or ask anything about privacy, security, that type of thing. And faculty perceptions here, very quickly. Um, generally, faculty like it. They always, obviously, they very, they very often have suggestions to make it a little better. But they really like the fact that they're able to communicate to students, again, especially in these large courses where it's really impossible for them to know out of their 600 students who might need a little extra encouragement. So they really like to be able to let students know what their status is. Um, they also really think, and we've had a lot of them, again, this is more anecdotal than scientific, but have said, I can really see the difference that this is making in the number of students that fail. They also point a lot to increased performance and engagement in a course. And so at the end of the day, the failure I talked about. Of course, they did negative things I didn't put on here. Again, most of it is I want four colors or I want to be able to add this criteria. Or, you know, so most of it is about the system itself rather than what goes on behind. So I didn't put that on here. Now, there's a video linked here that you can see. This is a video of faculty perceptions. It's about 11, four minutes, four minutes. Um, and so you can see directly what faculty say about this. And also, there is several resources available. This will go forward. Um, here, we'll leave this up while we do questions. Um, there's a Jetpack, which is a free app in the Apple iStore, in the Apple App Store, and, and Android, sorry, and Android. And you, if you download this, 
you can log in and you'll see LAK 12 learning analytics pack. You'll have the slides in there as well as about 15 other resources about work that we've done um, and that type of thing. So that might be a good resource for you. I think we're up to questions. <laughs> good thing we I'm left. Sorry, we're out of time. Good I thing we know. left seven minutes. <laughs> we thought there might be questions, so yes. Okay, a, a quick double-sided question. Yes. One, when a student gets a red signal, do they get any inf any additional information about what help them about what to what first actions to take? And second, you didn't mention the fact they pushed back and said, I don't like signals because it gives me a lot more to do. I have to intervene a lot more and there's a lot more of a load on me. Sure. Number one, the way that the interventions are delivered to students in the faculty hand completely. Um, we certainly, they know their students, they know the material, they're the ones that do the interventions. However, students do get the um, signal on their course homepage and if they click on that, it does say, um, here's why you're in this group, and here's possible resources to help you. As far as the actual emails or you know, pulling people aside after class on the instructor's hand. The second question about faculty pushback um, on, it, it really, I mean, what was it specifically? Yeah, oh. more I mean, we'll have, and if you watch that video, you'll see a faculty member says, yeah, I get more email. But, um, I mean, in terms of running the signal, it takes about 15 minutes. It's a half hour orientation and maybe 10 to 15 minutes every time they run it. So it's not, we're not talking gobs of time, and we don't really get pushback on that. The more pushback comes from how the system works, uh, the factors that are calculated into it, and wanting to have a little more control at the course level, which the system doesn't currently provide. Hi, John. Hello. I got your difficult question. <laughs> I was a little curious uh, how you picked the courses that were initially chosen to have the signals deployed into them. Um, and more specifically, did you check historical data to make sure those courses did not just happen to be courses that were involved in easier degrees as a possible alternative right. explanation for the change in pass rate? Okay. The, <laughs> I need your slide, yeah, for difficult questions. Um, I think, first of all, the way that we started, we chose faculty that played nicely with us. They both happen to be in STEM disciplines. Um, so, and they are traditionally very high DFW rate courses, so they're not um, easy courses per se. And specifically in the biology course, the standard that the instructor set Basically, if you didn't have a 90% or above, she said you were in massive damage, or massive danger of being unsuccessful because it was a course for majors only. And if you weren't getting an A, you probably weren't gonna survive in the major. After that, pretty much it was instructor opt-in. We did recruit, we did go out and try to talk to faculty from different disciplines. We wanted to hit across the board. Um, so we did do some of that, but in general, again, this is totally faculty opt-in, so. Well, I thought your pre-post signal course level, and that was for every conclusion mark off, do you have any pre-post degree retention signals? Not yet, forthcoming. Just the retention rates I shared already. Yeah, we have a um, massive set of data that you'll, you'll see stuff from us in this coming year, for sure. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd be interested in your speculation. If Signals is very effective and you're retaining more and more students and you're also admitting to capacity, what's likely to happen to the characteristics of the university population? <laughs> We've been on a steady trend upwards for the last 15 years, give or take, uh, based on strategic, based on the enrollment management pieces and uh, just strategic goals of the, of the university. Um, I think it's gonna continue as an institution, even as Indiana's land grant, um, there's been a concerted effort to increase the quote-unquote quality of the student coming in, their academic preparation. Uh, in the state of Indiana, there's, there's pieces, uh, math is required, four years of math is required uh, in almost nearly every public institution, four-year institution in the state. And so that automatically is gonna increase the quality of the student coming up. Uh, I think the fact that we're gonna be retaining more students, it's also a strategic goal of the institution. We're at about a 90% first to second year retention rate. Uh, our board would like us closer to 95%. Uh, and so anything that we can throw at that process is going to help. In terms of what it's gonna do to the student body, um, it, it's, I mean, it's gonna be interesting to see what that does. I'm gonna let John weigh in a little bit. Right, we'll 
point out what we've done is out main campus only, so we haven't pulled in regionals yet. So, yes. Hi. Um, I have a question for you. Does your institution have uh, required student evaluation of teachings at the end of term? And are they online? Yes, they, they're online. Yes, they're online. Okay. Yes, so they're required. So two questions. Have you done any correlation to find out whether or not there is an increase, because we're looking at sort of somewhat independent pieces um, related to the student perceptions, whether there's an increase in both their perception of their student, their, the faculty members' overall quality of teaching and also response rates related to those particular faculty members, whether they're higher. Okay. So I'm curious about whether there's any data yet. We have not looked at course evaluations yet. Those are pretty tightly controlled. Th oh, yeah. they're, they're anonymous. Very tightly controlled. They're anonymous, no. but you can determine who goes where. We could do some linkages. They're required by the faculty members to have them. The students are not required to complete them. No, we, uh, we have so, a, something similar. I'm just curious because I'm wondering about whether there's ways that the, that type of you know, you're looking for sure. data to bring other faculty in, and if they, it's not about even as much that they increase, but as right. response rates increase, those kinds of things, and that, that right. investment is, that additional investment the faculty member makes might come out and also right. help the faculty members themselves kind of move forward there. I think Certainly. that's a great observation. That's definitely something we should consider. Thank you. Is there any, uh, is there, are there any plans for investigating maybe what um, learning practices are more effective versus others in terms of, you know, not just, so not just having direct instru instruction, which is very popular in gateway classes, or so you can, the case method, action learning, experiential learning, yes. problem-based learning, and building metrics on, on how those methods more than maybe instructor are predictive of success in students. Yeah, right now, actually, at Purdue, we're undergoing a, a course transformation process and project. Uh, ten, year, 10 courses last year, 20 courses this year, 30 courses next, and the goal is to sustain, I don't know if it's going to be 30, but sustain some level of courses being transformed um, through a backwards design model uh, and incorporating, really changing up these high DFW and these, high, and these gateway courses and taking them from, actually doing exactly quite what you said and moving it out of stage on the stage uh, and more into these active learning profiles, more flip designs, uh, hybrid and blended courses and things like that. So that's happening. How that's going to impact this is, remains to be seen. And I think this is our last question. Um, I, I'm curious about the potential dark side. Um, if a, say a student has got red measures, okay, so is there a potential that the member of faculty staff is going to say, well, I'm not going to bother talking to that person because I'm not going to help them. Are you aware of that having happened in any case? <laughs> yes and no. Um, there's a lot of faculty who will focus solely on the red, and there's a lot that will focus on red and yellow. The most movement that we see across the board is in that yellow group. They're the ones who are, you know, probably going to get a C but, or a D plus, but they're able to sort of pull up to the higher groups. We have had a couple faculty who have made two interventions and tried to help, especially the red students. But if the red students fell to the bottom and they didn't seek help, they didn't do anything the instructor recommended, then that instructor would stop spending time on them because they have 100 other students to worry about that are doing what they recommend and are trying to do better. So that's the only instance I know of an instructor saying, I'm, not, I'm just not going to care about the students at the bottom. Yeah, on the flip side, though, the system does also have an advisor dashboard. So an advisor can pull up his or her students and see how they, what signals they have in the, signals in the courses and actually can intervene from that end as well. So if a faculty member has ceased intervening, the advisor's goal is to help get a student through college. Uh, and so they can actually intervene them on their own. And that's something we'll be rolling out broadly this fall to the, stu to the staff. It's actually there now. Nobody just knows about it. You have to log into the system to see it. And so if you don't log into it, you don't see it. Um, but we'll be kind of publicizing that further this fall in the, in the, in the hopes of actually um, not having that kind of situation take place. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.